throughout the conversations of risk assessment and risk treatment, and as we've been looking at the frameworks, like the risk management framework, to give you step-by-step -step guidance of how to perform risk management, we keep talking about identifying you know, your assets and the risk to those assets, and then you know, you'll start to select con you know, controls to help deal with those vulnerabilities. We often mention cost. Well, now it's time to kind of look at how we get to cost with risk analysis. Now, risk analysis is still identifying those potential threats, um, but it's focused on determining the asset value and the cost of the controls so that we can determine whether we want to invest in a certain level of control or we don't want to invest. And so there's some calculations involved in this. Really, there's two kind of terms we want to look at. It's a quantitative analysis versus a qualitative analysis. And in an earlier course, I had mentioned these, but here's where we're gonna drill down deeper on these and do some calculations. So first of all, quantitative. This is where we're gonna determine the cost if an asset is lost, as in 100% lost. Well, maybe not 100%, and that's part of the issue here. I want you to think about this. You know, there is times when you could lose an entire device. The device completely fails, there's going to be a cost to replacing that device. There's going to be a cost due to the outage until we get it replaced. Well, but some things don't fail 100%. And that's what we need to take in account for. And we try to figure that out. So cost of replacement um, of the, the actual asset itself. If it's, you know, a piece of hardware, that kind of makes sense. I bought a server, it cost me 10 grand. If, I comp if that server has a meltdown, I mean completely melts down, I'm gonna have to spend another 10 grand. But also in that cost of replacement, we wanna think about like salaries that are involved. The people that are doing the replacement, well, they have time and cost associated with them as well. There, if it's an application, maybe there's some additional development that has to be done. Maybe when the asset was lost, it also caused other assets to fail. That would be a liability cost. Now, you might be saying, well, how am I supposed to determine all of this? And, and, and that's one of the challenges to doing this. This is the investigative or analysis side to this is if I if, you know, switch a crashes, does it take anything else with it? And we how much did switch a cost us? And how much time is it going to take to replace it? How much does you know, if Bob is going to replace it? What do I pay Bob? per hour to do that. So you have to add the numbers up to get your cost. Now, a couple of a little bit of the terminology that we're looking at is single loss expectancy SLE. And by the way, you want to know this for the exam. This is the one time cost of the loss. And how we calculate that and it looks a little strange is first of all, we needed the asset value in dollars. So AV will be the asset value in dollars. And then EF is the exposure factor as a percentage. Here's what we mean by exposure factor. Is it going to be a 100% loss? Is it we looking at a 50% loss? And, and I'm going to give you a couple of examples to kind of clarify that. Well, the equation is pretty straightforward. The single loss expectancy is the asset value in dollars um, times its exposure factor. So let's take a look at an example. I've already started using this of a network switch. So let's say that the switch um, and the time that it takes, the cost of the switch and the time that it takes to replace the switch. Notice how I've added salary into this. Let's say it costs us 20 grand. And if the switch fails, it's a 100% failure. I mean, we lose that portion of the network. Well, then we'll take 20,000 times one and 100% failure. That gives us our single loss expectancy, which is going to be 20 grand. But let's take a different approach. Let's say I have a database server that's providing data through databases um, and, and through applications out to the employees. On that database server, let's say we have a failure of a database, and that's about a 50% failure. I've got two databases out there, it's 50%. It causes a 50% disruption. Let's say that to bring that database back up, I've determined that somebody has to sit there and restore it, the time that it takes to restore it, the business value that's lost during that time to restore it. The database server itself has experienced a 50% loss. So $10,000 is the cost that I have for it. 
the asset value and times 0.5, which means, well, I'm not going to have a $10,000 loss if, if I get an event. It's going to be a $5,000 loss. Now, you might be saying, well, okay, so I've determined how much I'm going to lose you know, if I have a, a, an event and I, I've determined what I'm going to lose in, in that single event, but I actually need to forecast this like over a year. Well, we can do that. With this information, we can now forecast our annualized loss expectancy, ALE. And this is what we're predicting to lose in a year. Now, I'll just tell you right now, you can start with a year. Some companies like to do two years, three years. That way they can try to uh, amortize the cost of some of the controls that they're putting in place and have a better understanding of the impact. But let's start with a year. So how we calculate this is we need the annualized rate of occurrence. That's a big word for how many times is it going to crash? Uh, <laughs> so between uh, how many times is it going to crash, the equation then becomes our annualized loss expectancy for a year is the SLE, our single loss expectancy, times how many times we think it's going to crash over a year. Now, kind of consider this for a moment. We've talked a lot about this throughout this course so far. So if you have threats to your assets, and your one of the threats is a hurricane, that's the agent that's going to and some of the uh, vectors for it are going to be high winds and you're going to have, uh, you know, high, you know, excessive rain, which can cause events like power outages and flooding, which will also then cause systems to go down and systems need to be replaced. Well, how many times does your area have a hurricane? Well, if, if you know, I live in Arizona, we don't have hurricanes. I don't need to worry about hurricanes. Now I do need to worry about big storms and power outages, and I need to worry about flooding, but how often do I, do we hear experience in that? Well, an interesting side note is we have a monsoon season. It's a basically between, you know, it's basically July and August. And during that monsoon season, we can have very short term, but very extreme storms with winds that get really close to hurricane speed and with torrential downpours that uh, just huge amounts of water come out of the sky. So for those two months, I can look at the farmer's almanac or I could look at past performance and say, uh, I think uh, we, we run the risk of having a, a power outage due to a uh, monsoon storm uh, probably five, six times a year. Now the year might be isolated to July and August, but that helps me then solve this equation. So as another example, so let's say that we're worried about a network outage and a temporary network outage due to power costs us, let's say $10,000. That's because um, the network has gone out, we've lost business, um, we've had to bring some systems back online that may not have been protected by, by a generator or batteries. And so let's say that we determine, and I'm using really simple numbers here, that we've determined it's 10 grand every time we have a network outage. And we expect, because we expect to lose power to this portion of the network, we expect that to occur four times a year. We can quickly see that our ALE for the year on this particular um, event um, and asset is going to be 40 grand. Now, here's the question. Now that I've determined that I'm going to have a network outage on some of this network gear because it's not protected, and it's going to cost me $40,000 a year. That's what I'm predicting. Well, how much does it cost to put in uh, some backup batteries? How much does it cost now to maybe put in another generator so that we can cover or mitigate the commercial loss of power? See how this is starting to work now? With this kind of factual data that we're putting together, we can now start to make decisions and decisions that we can back up with dollars and cents. Now, a, a, a generator, it's gonna cost more than 40 grand. Uh, <laughs> probably, uh, you know, those big outdoor business generators kind of thing, but maybe backup batteries that can keep that network up for a couple of minutes, uh, maybe 20 minutes. Maybe that would help reduce the loss to the organization. And so these are the things that we start to factor in. As a side note, also, uh, you do wanna keep these equations in mind for when you take the exam, but more importantly for real life, understand that it's more than just, you know, when we say 
cost of replacement, remember there's salaries involved um, and time that it takes and the business might be losing money uh, due to lack of sales or, or, or customer dissatisfaction that also needs to be factored in. Now, this is the quantitative loss uh, or the quantitative uh, analysis that we want to do. We do have another one. And that part of our risk analysis uh, analysis is the qualitative one. Or the, I, did I say qualitative before? That was quantitative that we just did. This is qualitative. And qualitative is is harder to determine the dollars that that apply to this because it's very subjective. And so as a strategy, we want to do the quantitative as best we can. And those are the hard facts that we can come up with. And then we need to be uh, sensitive to the qualitative side and the qualitative side can involve things um, because there's no dollars, it often is going to be ranked um, as far as an analysis as, you know, how likely is it to impact and the level of its impact will be ranked by words like high, medium or low, or it could be done like numbers like on a scale one to five, five being the highest amount of impact. What would this particular event subjectively do? And it would rank maybe a three. Well, the reason this is hard to determine is because we need to ask people about their experiences. Yeah, we need to ask subject matter experts and we need to conduct interviews to find out if this event occurs, what has happened in the past? What has happened to other companies? And you're probably saying to yourself at this point, what events are you talking about that, that would be so elusive to be able to come up with? And what it really is, is any event that could cause damage to things that are more intangible to grab hold of. Um, customers, let's say an event occurs where it causes customers to have ill will um, towards the business and they, those customers start to leave. What event could that be? Well, depending upon your business, it could be a variety of different things, but let's just say that someone, you know, hacked into the network or somebody internal released, you know, customer confidential information and made it public. This creates um, issues. And now here's the thing. It's hard to sometimes monetize how much revenue did we lose because customers were leaving or customers, we, we damage the goodwill with customers. Now, also events can occur where we have loss of employee productivity and not all of it is measurable. I, I remember I was uh, helping a business with a, a very large commerce site and we had very clear statistics that if the commerce site could not take orders, that they would lose X amount of dollars per hour. And I, I don't remember actually what the dollar amount was. I just remember at the time, it seemed like a lot of money. But we had good solid facts on these are the orders that don't get placed and they don't get placed in the future. In other words, customers went to somewhere else. Well, okay, that's a good set of hard numbers, but it doesn't show the loss to employee productivity. If those orders aren't being placed, that means, well, the orders aren't going to the warehouse. The warehouse isn't picking the products, isn't shipping the products, which means I've got warehousing people that are sitting around waiting for the ordering system to come back online. And I've got salaries tied to that. Now you might be saying, well, we can figure that out. In a lot of cases, we do figure it out. But think about what I had mentioned. A lot of customers aren't going to come back. They're going to order it from somewhere else. So that gets really hard to start to determine as part of the qualitative analysis. And I just have to say that for good reasons and for bad reasons, bad publicity is very uh, hard to determine what the effect on some businesses is going to be. But as I noted uh, with you at the towards the very beginning, Bad publicity is, is, is something that is also motivating a lot of companies to get better at their risk management processes and to do better at their analysis on all of this. Now, that's the good that comes out of it. The bad that comes out of it is that, quite honestly, people are being affected by this. It's affecting their lives, their careers. You know, everybody's got a mortgage to pay. Bad publicity really it just creates even more problems for the company. And it's hard to track sometimes what that loss is. But if it appears on CNN, it's not going to be a good day.